Do as we say, not as we do. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, because we're arrogant. And we we actually, I don't know, did somebody believe the Russians say, yeah, that's, that, that's a good plan. We just won't inspect you, but you can inspect us. So they're negotiating right now how to get the inspections back on track to breathe confidence back into this treaty, which is going to expire in 2026. Now, it has the ability to be automatically renewed for five years. But to do that, the Russians have to have trust that the United States is going to faithfully execute the, the, the treaty properly. But the United States is an open violation of the treaty, not just about the inspectors, but about how we designate B-52 bombers, what we're doing about missile uh, launch tubes. We, we just lie. We are literally the INF treaty. We withdrew from it in 2019. We blamed the Russians. We said, you're cheating. The Russians are going, we're not cheating. We said, no, it's this missile. You're cheating. The Russians went, hey, here's the missile. We've laid it out here. Come in, inspect it. Look at it. You can see we're not cheating. We went, no, we're not going to come in and inspect it. We're just going to say you're cheating and we're withdrawing from the treaty. Meanwhile, the Russians were saying, you guys are you're, are cheating. You're uh, deploying a a launch system onto shore. It was on a ship. And on the ship, it could launch both surface-to-air missiles and cruise missiles. But a, a ship launch cruise missile is permitted under the INF treaty. A ground launch cruise missile is not. We deployed the same launch system onto the ground in Poland and Romania. And we said only surface-to-air missiles are fine. Don't worry. And the Russians are going... Yeah, but you can launch a cruise missile from that, which means the system is in violation of the INF treaty. We said, no, 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 no. We would never do that. Never do that. We withdrew from the INF treaty less than a month afterwards. We tested a ground launch cruise missile using that same system, which means we've been preparing for it all along. We're liars. We're cheaters. We can't be trusted. And yet, if we're if the world's going to be saved, Russia has to find a way to trust us enough to enter into these arms control treaties that hopefully will reenact what Ronald Reagan did back in 1987-88, save the world from nuclear annihilation. William Burns, learn his name and pray he succeeds, because if he does succeed, we can get back on this, this diplomatic path out of the disaster that's building up right now in Europe. Yeah, I mean, uh, you and I absolutely agree that it all comes down to diplomacy. It's it, I, I always love this this, oh, my God, if you speak to this other world leader, then it means you are instantly corrupted. Like, you know, Donald Trump, despite the fact that I hate him as much as I hate Joe Biden. But, uh, you know, when he's speaking to Kim Jong Un, they're like, oh, my God, that makes him instantly corrupted. It's like, no, if we're going to avoid nuclear war, if we're going to avoid endless death, all of these world leaders should be talking a lot. <laughs> Like, well, the, the thing about Trump, this, this naughty he, word, he was this close. I mean, a lot of people, again, I'm, I'm with you on Donald Trump. It's like, you know, I'm not happy, <laughs> but OK, he's the president and he's inherited a North Korean policy package that says no direct negotiation with the North Koreans. And he's looking at it saying, but how, where has that gotten us? You're telling me that the number one threat that we might have to go to war and that war might be nuclear. And the one thing you can say about Donald Trump is he's a businessman. I don't I'm not going to sit here and say he's the best businessman in the world, but he's a businessman who knows one basic truth. You ain't going to make money. If there's a nuclear war, <laughs> if there's a nuclear war. Yeah. You're not making money. And for Donald Trump, that's not a good thing. So he's like, we need to change it up. Why don't we talk to the guy? Oh, God, no, you can't talk to him. No, that's a weakness. He's like, no, maybe it's good business acumen. Let me go talk to the guy. So he did. He opened a line of communication. The second meeting in Hanoi, Kim Jong-un actually believed Donald Trump when Donald Trump said, I'm serious about this. Kim Jong-un went, you know, everybody's like, Kim Jong-un is a brutal dictator. He does whatever he wants. No, he's a communist leader. And there's a thing called the Communist Party of North Korea that will hang him out to dry if he does anything that hurts North Korea. So Kim Jong-un goes and meets with the North Korean communist high command. And he says, Trump's serious about disarmament. You, we need to do something. They're all like, no, boss, we don't want to do that. That's very bad. We don't want to give this up because you can't trust the Americans. We're going to give this up and they're going to screw us like they screwed the Iranians. Can't do it. Kim Jong, no, no, no. I, I think this guy's good. So they gave him what he wanted. He came in with a real package. You know, one of the reasons why those documents in Mar-a Largo that were seized by the FBI are so classified because they contain information that the U.S. government, not Trump, the U.S. government doesn't want the American people to know how close we actually came to denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula. The North Koreans were willing to put it all on the table. They had it wow. right there in writing. And Donald Trump was going to do it. All he had to do is agree to lift sanctions. But 
Mike Pompeo, yeah, on Bolton came in, stabbed Trump in the back, undermined the whole thing, and and and, and that was it. Trump tried to revive it when he met with uh, Kim Jong Un at the DMZ, but by then it was too late. He had an election coming up. But what did the North Koreans do? They expressed their disappointment, but they left the door open for Joe Biden. They said, "Hey, Trump disappointed us, but come on, we can still get this thing done." Because we believe that our future isn't nuclear weapons. Our future is economic engagement with the world. Our, our people need this economic engagement. We want to do this economic engagement. And we're willing to give up our nuclear capability for that. Biden ignored them, ignored them. And finally, the North Koreans just recently said, all right, the hell with you then. Um, we have a viable nuclear deterrent. We're going to use it. Uh, now, if you attack us, we nuke everything. Oh, and by the way, when I say everything, I mean you too, America. It's like Al Pacino and Scarface. Meet my little friend. You know, it's called the biggest missile in North Korea, and it can hit anywhere in America. And they just fired one the other day. And they fired it yeah. and said, we got you. We own you. That thing has a nuclear warhead. You can't shoot it down. And an American city goes, bye-bye. Wow. Are we safer today, America? Are we safer because the establishment said you can't talk to North Korea? Can't do it. It's a bad precedent. Bad pre- you know what's a bad precedent? creating the potential for a nuclear conflict. That's a bad precedent. American people have to get their their head out of the sand. Nuclear war is real, guys, and we're not going to win it. We're not going to win it. Yeah, and and I also like to remind people who who sometimes act like Trump was just across the board anti-war. That's not true at all. Trump, uh, you know, tens of thousands of bombs were dropped under Trump. Oh, yeah, yeah, by, yeah, yeah. by assassinating Soleimani, he put us on the brink of nuclear war as well. Uh, so, yeah, he, he oh, he's did not some, perfect. He's yeah, not perfect no, no, at all. Yeah, uh, no, I'm agreeing with you. He, he did some things right for his own reasons. And but he's not Mr. He's not a peacenik or anything. But anyway, well, I want, businessman. So, yeah, businessman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I wanted to jump back to uh, to the the proxy war in Ukraine, and a lot of people don't know this, and it kind of blew my mind when I when I read about it. Um, Sheer Post and many others covered it, not the mainstream media, that there was actually a peace deal, you know, basically ready to be signed between Zelensky and Putin in April, and then Boris Johnson, as a representative of the U.S., basically. Uh, went running there and basically said to Zelensky, end the peace talks. If you sign this thing, uh, all your Western allies are pulling out and you'll be left in this alone. Is that- yeah, no. Um, you know, again, the final history uh, will hopefully be written on this, um, this, this conflict and it will be an accurate one. Right now, it's still very murky what happened uh, around Kiev with Russian troops. Were they trying to take Kiev? Were there just a, a demonstration? Um, were they trying to intimidate the government? Um, were they defeated? Uh, you know, they had this 60 mile long convoy that was there ready to move on Kiev and everybody agreed there was nothing the Ukrainians could do to stop it. Then the convoy disappeared and the troops went away. Um, and the Russians say this was a good faith gesture on our part, that we were serious about peace. So we withdrew all our troops from around Kiev and in northern, uh, northern Ukraine in anticipation of a, a meeting on April 1st in Istanbul where, uh, from all accounts, there was a genuine peace agreement on the table. Um, it was one that would require North Korea to recognize the independence of uh, Lugansk and Donetsk and recognize uh, that Crimea was forever Russia, but it would have returned Kherson, Zaporizhia, and all the other occupied territories to, to Ukraine, and it would have ended the conflict. Um, and the Ukrainians were ready to sign, because I think at that point in time, Ukraine saw the writing on the wall and realized, you know, the Russians have us beat. Um, but then Boris Johnson flew in and said, no, 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 no. We feel that the Russians are weak. We feel that the Russians are desperate. Why else would they go to the negotiating table? Rather than help Russia out of this conflict, we want to double down. Uh, we want to build up your army, send in all this equipment so that Lloyd Austin could say our goal isn't, uh, you know, it's not that there, our goal was to defeat Russia, but to inflict pain on Russia. That's what this became about. It was using yeah. Ukraine as a vehicle to inflict pain. Um, and, you know, Lindsey Graham has uh, voiced this quite accurately when he said uh, that America is willing to fight to the last Ukrainian. I mean, he literally said that. 
Um, normally people say that and it's like an implied. No, he said it. Fight to the last Ukrainian. Um, and, and that's where we are today. They, they, they missed the peace opportunity. And now Russia is not going to go to the table for that deal. It's too late. Uh, Russia has absorbed uh, not just the Donbass and, and Crimea, but they've absorbed uh, Kherson and Zaporizhia. Uh, Article 64 of the Russian Constitution um, makes these part these lands part of Mother Russia. You can't just give them up in a peace treaty. <laughs> so any, everybody's going, oh, the Russians are willing, are, they're going to negotiate. We're going to go back to the April 1st uh, Accord. Russia will give up. I'm like, no, no, no. What, what, do you, what do you not understand about Russia to know that once they have anointed territory to be Mother Russia, you ain't never getting it back, ever, ever. Um, the best you can hope for is that the Russians decide don't not to take that holy water and sprinkle it on Odessa or sprinkle it on Kharkov or Nikolaev or Nepopetrovsk, uh, because that's what's going to happen when 200,000 troops show up next month, because uh, Ukraine's got nothing left. They've burned out everything. Their troops have been slaughtered. Their equipment has been destroyed. And NATO doesn't have the ability to, to, to replace it in a timely fashion. What, what's their what do you think their plan is now? Russia's plan. Well, I mean, and 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 can you speak also? To, there's just it seems like there's a trickle of reports of Russia, you know, pulling out of this city or that city, and I never know what to believe or not to believe. So, you know, if you can talk about that as well. Well, I mean, I think we we acknowledge up front that Russia made some mistakes early on. Yeah, and one of yeah, the mistakes yeah. is a, a you know a planning mistake. Uh, it became apparent that the two hundred thousand troops uh, weren't up to the task. It's something that I recognized back in uh, in April, May, um, when when I heard that the United States was getting ready to pass a 40 plus billion dollar aid package. I said that this was a game changer, that basically uh, by rebuilding, reconstituting the Ukrainian army using this NATO equipment, um, they were creating a new paradigm and Russia didn't have sufficient forces to deal with this paradigm. But Russia didn't mobilize back then. They stayed with the same number of troops. And as a result, in September, the Ukrainians launched a counterattack, and they uh, they were able to penetrate thinly held Russian defenses in Kharkov and in Kherson, causing the Russians to pull back and consolidate their defenses. Instead of having 60 men per kilometer of line, Lee, go out and walk a kilometer, and then tell me if you think 60 men can hold it. <clears throat> I'm telling you, as a Marine, they can't. Uh, so, you know, they, 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 they brought it in now, and they, they have... You know, more like two to 300 guys per kilometer, which is more reasonable. Plus, they have a defense in depth. So even if the Ukrainians penetrate, they can defend properly. And Kherson, they, they went through a little bit. But um, what happened with Kherson is there's the Dnieper River down there. And the Ukrainians used this American-provided HIMARS and M777 uh, artillery to destroy bridges um, and make it difficult for the Russians to resupply these forces. But this, everybody's like, well, the Ukrainians are, are, are driving them back. Really? Look at the casualties just for the Kherson in the month of October. 12,000 Ukrainian casualties, 12,000, 1,500 Russian casualties. That's an exchange rate Russia will live with every day of the week. But what Russia didn't yeah. want to do is keep this fight up and lose another three to 5,000 troops um, because it was going to become more difficult to maintain the advantages they had if you couldn't resupply the artillery and the, and the troops. So Russia said, rather than hold on to territory at this huge cost of life, let's withdraw across the river. They brought as many civilians as wanted to come. There was around 220,000 civilians there. Russia brought out about 170,000 of them, brought them out. They've resettled them. Uh, the military has dug in, consolidated fences, and that's where they're at right now. Dug in and consolidated while they await for the troops that they mobilized in September, they're finishing up their training now, and they're going to be arriving starting next month, uh, about 220,000 organized into 10 to 15 divisions. Um, that's a big mailed fist that's coming in, and it's a game changer. Uh, Ukraine's got nothing to respond to it. They've burned through all of their, their all the army that we built up, we being NATO, built up over the summer. Uh, has been burned through. Their burn rate is atrocious. Like I said, not just the 12,000 in Kherson. They lost 20,000 prior to that, and they lost another 20 to 30,000 in the north in Kharkiv. That's 60, 62,000. Um, we trained maybe 80,000. So of the 80,000 that were trained over the course of the summer in two waves, the, the Ukrainians have burned through 62,000, including much of the equipment. And NATO's telling them right now, we don't have anything left to give you. 
We've got nothing left to give you. Um, they're going to train another 12,000 troops. But <laughs> I don't know. Marine math, man. I'm just trying to figure out how 12,000 uh, equals 80,000 and how 80,000 can stand up to 220,000. We got 220,000 Russians coming in, well-equipped, well-trained, fully supported, moving in on the battlefield, and Ukraine's got nothing, literally nothing. And um, this is this is problematic. I mean, right now, everybody can sit there and say, oh, the Ukrainians kicked butt. They took Kharkov, they took Kherson. But they did so. It's a perfect victory. The Russians withdrew because they weren't willing to sacrifice lives needlessly. They withdrew because they were preserving their most precious resource, which is their manpower. And they withdrew until which time they accrue the advantages that they're going to gain when these reinforcements come in. And here's the other thing. Anybody who's hoping for a diplomatic outcome right now, that ship has sailed. Russia didn't mobilize just to give away all those advantages. Russia didn't suffer the losses it suffered just to give away all those, you know, give away the advantages they're accruing. Russia will, unfortunately, for people who believe in peace like you and I, Russia is probably going to go on a major offensive uh, and they're going to redefine the reality in Ukraine. Um, and only at that point in time will they be open to meaningful um, negotiations. And here's the, here's the question. What does redefine the reality mean? Putin, uh, you know, every year he does this thing called the Valdai Conference. Um, and I, I strongly recommend people to go in and, and look at his previous speeches. Look at the one especially he gave this year. He's literally if not the smartest, one of the smartest leaders in the world today. The man is articulate, he's knowledgeable. He gave a, I don't know, about an hour long address, but the best part isn't his address because that's always prepared for comments. Anybody can give a prepared speech. Not for an hour, Joe Biden have trouble going past 15 minutes, but anybody can give a prepared speech. But then he did four hours, four hours of question and answer. And he's articulate, he's on target, he's sharp, he's humorous, he doesn't tire. And one of the questions was from a Hungarian journalist who said, um, hey, uh, I like Odessa. Uh, I want to visit it. When would be a good time for me to visit? And Putin said, uh, well, sooner rather than later, meaning something's getting ready to happen in Odessa. But then he answered in a way, um, it, you know, he uses Russian colloquialisms a lot, but he answered in a way that basically said that Odessa is the key. Odessa can either be the key to a peaceful outcome for this conflict or Odessa will be the key for a, a, a more violent Russian solution. So I think he's saying that Russia is open to a peace settlement that leaves Odessa, which is historically a Russian city, leaves Odessa under Ukrainian sovereignty. And this would be a plus for Ukraine because it gives Ukraine an outlet to the sea. It makes their economy viable. Uh, but if Ukraine doesn't take advantage of this and continues the fight, Russia will take Odessa will make Odessa part of Mother Russia, and then Article 64 of the Russian Constitution kicks in, and the Ukrainians will never, ever, ever get it back. So we're, we're, you know, we're at one of those important uh, tipping points in history, and a lot is on Zelensky's shoulders, and unfortunately, he's showing himself not to be up to the task of uh, the leadership that's required at this point in time. Yeah, I mean, he's just come off as a puff, puppet of Western interest. It, it just seems at, at every at every stage. Um, by the way, I just wanted to pause real quick and say we've got about three thousand people watching live. Please remember to click subscribe and to uh, and and to you know join up so you can watch uh, the upcoming interviews as well. But I wanted to you 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 spoke of the the kind of larger picture. I wanted to see if you had any thoughts on the the larger picture kind of globally the u.s you know is involved in this proxy war because we are fear correctly that we're losing the u.s empire our hegemony and and russia is a, was aligning with closely with europe and is obviously aligning with china and but if you look at you know the numbers i've seen reporting are that over 80 percent of the actual population of the world is not supporting the U.S. proxy war in Ukraine. They're not necessarily supporting Russia, but they're either supporting Russia or not, or, or neutral, meaning they're not falling in line behind the U.S., which says a lot about U.S. power around the globe. Well, I mean, one of the more interesting documents to read right now is the National Security Strategy of the United States, which the Biden administration published uh, last month. Um, <laughs> it's almost like it's a comedy. Um, I mean, a, a pathetic comedy, um, because 
he literally writes that American democracy is that vehicle which will save the world, that the world recognizes the value of American leadership because American leadership springs forth from American democracy and the world wants American democracy. And I'm looking at going, have you taken a look at the state of American democracy recently? Yeah. Uh, this ain't the bright signing city on the hill. I mean, I love my country. I love my country enough to know that we have to fix a lot of problems before we go parading out in public saying, look at us, emulate us. Right now, we're sort of a, you know, a heroin addict uh, living in a ghetto. Uh, nobody wants to see us. Nobody wants to be part of us. But we're out there selling ourselves in this fashion. And then we turn around and say our opponents are the evil autocrats. You know, and that's the Russians and the Chinese and the Russians and the Chinese going, wow, I mean, actually, when we have elections, well, not the Chinese so much, but the Russians, when we have elections, we can count the votes in one day. How long did it take you to count the votes, America? Eight days? Wow. That's, that's prime democratic stuff there because people have a lot of confidence when it takes eight days to count a vote. Nobody thinks that maybe something's going on. I've I mean, done I, I've done more reports than almost anyone on the insanity of our computer voting systems. But <laughs> way, way way before Trump made it a Trump thing. But anyway, yeah, yeah, no, I agree with you. I just think it's hypocritical when we send these uh, you know voter observers around the world to criticize how other people do elections, yeah. um, and the standards we hold them to. Uh, we can never meet. We couldn't meet any of the standards we hold everybody else to. But we're the democracy, according to Joe Biden, that is the greatest thing in the world. And it's not just that. It's the world is tired of the American game. You know, we 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 um, we are promulgating something we call the rules based international order. It's been in place since the end of the Second World War. It's not the rule of law. The rule of law is set forth by the United Nations Charter. Rules based international order is the club, the American club. Come on in the club. We make the rules. Uh, you know, uh, we'll take care of you, but understand the relationship. We are the owner of the club. Uh, you are not even a guest. You're, you're hired help. Uh, we'll, we'll feed you when we can, uh, but you work for us. Um, and that's the relationship you need to understand. But the world seems to believe that we're all in the same club together and America's our partner. We're all part. No, America's not a partner with anybody. America only cares about America. We prove that by blowing up Nord Stream pipelines. We don't care about the Germans. We care about America. The rules-based international order is about maintaining the system that promotes American hegemony. Um, and the world's fed up with it. One of the main things we do in this thing is uh, through the power of the petrodollar, the dollar, uh, through the swift banking system. Basically, anything that touches a dollar now can be sanctioned by the United States, which Congress thinks that they actually aren't just the American people uh, that they govern. They believe they govern the world, that they can dictate to the world how to do things. And if you don't do it the way we like it, we'll sanction you. And we do that because you touch the dollar. Well, the world used to not be able to get away from the dollar because it was the only stable currency and available uh, to do these big oil-based transactions. Not anymore. The world's tired of it. They're tired of this game. And uh, they're all walking away from it. There's now challenges out there from BRICS. Um, you know, you see BRICS talking about an alternative reserve currency. They're already trading oil contracts. Well, explain to people. Some people might not know the term BRICS. Oh, I'm sorry. I um, I just did another interview before this, and I I, I did explain it there. And I just, just my brain was yeah, saying, "Hey, yeah, I no, talked right. about this." Uh, but this is a uh, it's an economic forum. Uh, the United States and and its allies created something called the G7 a while back, called the Group of Seven. It's the largest industrial, most advanced industrial nations in the world. And the purpose of the G7 is to promote the G7, which means to promote the United States. Remember that club, how America uses the people to make America better? The G7 is designed to make America better. Um, then what we did is we said, okay, now we're going to expand the G7 into something called G20. And it's how the G7 can control the rest of the world to make America better. See the relationship. Well, the rest of the world said, we don't want to play that game anymore. And so they formed something called the BRICS Forum. It's Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, uh, far, five what called developing economies that are approaching uh, the, the status of or in stature of a G7 group. Some nations are, I mean, like China. China is bigger than almost anybody in the G7, but they're not invited. But so they formed the BRICS forum and, and they come up with joint trading policies, uh, et cetera. And BRICS is succeeding wildly. Let me just throw this out there. If you take the G20, group of 20, 
and you subtract the G7, you got 13 nations left. What do we call those 13 nations? BRICS. <laughs> the G20 is BRICS. <laughs> BRICS is taking over. They don't want to play the game anymore. BRICS isn't playing the G20, G7, Make America Greater game. BRICS is playing, we want to have a multipolar world. We don't want a world-based international world where America rules supreme. We want a multipolar world where everybody has a seat at the table, including America. But BRICS is, is creating economic policies, and it's so successful that Iran and Argentina have already joined it. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and other nations are signing up for it. Uh, everybody's running to be part of BRICS. Um, and BRICS is basically saying that they're not going to play the sanction game anymore. Basically, they're, 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 they're getting rid of the dollar as a currency of, trans, of global transaction. Um, and they're going to isolate. And if they do this and they succeed in this and they're going to succeed, if you're an American, understand that what backs your dollar? Global confidence. And when the, global, yeah. when the, when the world loses confidence in the American dollar, you're going to have to take a wheelbarrow of that paper to a, to a store to buy it. Well, and it was, it, it's the only reason we've been able to just print money and spend a trillion dollars a year on a military. And, and it's never really impacted the uh, the strength of the dollar is because of exactly that. You take that away and all of a sudden the trillion dollars disappearing a year matters. Uh, I, uh, final question. Uh, I You know. You you were in these these esteemed establishments. You were you know uh, uh, you were in the Marines. You were a UN weapons inspector. Do you like all these insane decisions that America makes uh, and NATO makes to push us towards nuclear war to to you know allow this war to go on to not sit down at peace tables and so many innocent people dying or harm the invasion of Iraq that killed a million people. Do you feel it's more idiocy or it's or it's just pure sociopathy? The people you interacted with, what what is wrong with them? <laughs> Tell me, Scott, well, what is wrong with them? <laughs> well, I mean, to be honest, look, America's never been perfect. And I'm not going to pretend that America ever was perfect. But I will say this. Um, when when I was in the Marines and when I was doing the, the, the war and when I did uh, the weapons inspections and things of that nature, um, common sense almost always prevailed almost always prevail. For instance, in the first uh, uh, Gulf War, Desert Storm, after we defeated the Iraqi army, there's a lot of people saying, we need to go to Baghdad. And uh, fortunately, we had, and we had a plan called the Arnold Plan. We were ready to take 110,000 troops and just shoot up the highway and take Baghdad. And fortunately, the adult leadership, which at the time surprisingly included Dick Cheney, said, that is the world's worst idea. That is not what we're going to do, because if we Buy it, we own it. If we take Baghdad, we own it. We don't have a plan. And I'm sitting there going, that's 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 thinking. Uh, the CIA um, challenged uh, during the INF Treaty, challenged some assumptions made about uh, Soviet cheating. And they, and they were right to challenge it. The Soviets weren't cheating. They saved the treaty. Uh, but there were people out there trying to sabotage it by lying. Um, the the, the uh, WMD thing, there were people that believed that we were going to disarm Iraq and then lift sanctions. But then something happened. See, the Cold War ended. When the Cold War ended, the rational thinkers went away because rational thinking only comes when there's consequences to your actions. I mean, when you have to sit there and go, if I do this, the causal effect analysis is something bad's going to happen. Maybe I don't want to do this. But then the Cold War ended and Russia stopped being the Soviet Union and it became Russia and we were trying to suppress it for a decade. There were no longer consequences. And as a result, we just started doing anything we wanted to do. And that's where we are today. We are literally spoiled, rotten brats, children in a candy store, uh, just doing whatever we want because mom's not there to watch us anymore. We're just doing anything we want. But the problem is the store owner is coming back and he's looking at the mess saying, I'm not going to play this game anymore. That's what bricks and, and the rest of it is. But America right now has lived a consequence-free existence for so long where we could, the, we assassinated an Iranian government official for no reason, for no reason. Yeah. yeah. We, 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 we acted as if we had a right to do this. We, had, we didn't have a right to do it. It was the most wrong thing possible, but there were no real consequences. The day of a consequence-free, um, you know, world where the America could do it is over. And Russia's proving we, 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 we announced a president, a new president of Venezuela who never even ran for president. <laughs> Juan Guaido. <laughs> He's become a meme. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no, I think you're absolutely right. No consequences. And now it's seeming like 
we may have finally run up against a consequence with these uh, these sanctions and the uh, it seems the order is changing. Well, Scott, I, I, I thank you for going a couple of minutes over. Uh, I really appreciate your time and appreciate you doing this. And uh, where would you like people to follow your work? Uh, if, if, if you're interested, um, there's a website, uh, scottritterextra.com. And there they'll have all the interviews. For instance, if you send me a link to this, I'll post it on the uh, on that so more people can watch it. Uh, when I write stuff, it goes on there. I have a little Substack thing going on. So but that's that's it. One stop shop. Scott Ritter, extra .com. All right. Thank